All right, welcome back to another installment of uh, Sport and the Law here. Uh, so with today's lesson, we are going to talk about uh, the chapter that's known as Governance Issues Within Professional Sport. But although the chapter talks about several different areas that sport managers um, should know about, I like to focus on this area of commissioner authority in the realm of governance and kind of expand this out. This is usually a topic that uh, has something in the news, uh, that, so it's usually topical. And for that reason, it also becomes one of the areas that are most interesting um, in terms of how sport and the law interact together. So from here on out, we will be really talking about commissioner authority issues uh, in the context of governance and how that interacts with uh, issues when people's constitutional rights may or may not be uh, in danger of being infringed upon. So let's go. All right. So this should not come as a surprise. The power of the commissioner within most professional sports organizations like the National Football League or the National Basketball Association and the like have different uh, wide-ranging powers that have been given to them from the owners of that league. Commissioners uh, are usually uh, hired in and appointed by these uh, league owners uh, pursuant to the governing documents of that organization. Uh, oftentimes it's a constitution. So the power of the commissioner in uh, these professional sport leagues goes something along these lines. They've got the approval, uh, the ability to approve player contracts, engage in rulemaking, help resolve dispute, res uh, help uh, resolve disputes, uh, whether it's organization and player or player and league or uh, player and player, etc. And then also discipline players in the event that they engage in misconduct. Uh, or if they violate the terms of their contract. Now, of course, we saw an issue come up from the textbook involving commissioner authority when you had uh, Charles Finley, who was uh, a very eccentric uh, owner uh, of the Oakland A's, and he uh, tried to sell several of his players um, to other leagues for uh, a good amount of money, even though that was against uh, the rules uh, because the commissioner said that that would um, injure competitive, competitive balance and that would go against the rules of the game. Ultimately, the commissioner uh, did, decided not to approve these player contracts being assigned to other uh, members of, the, of Major League Baseball. Finley sued uh, because he said that the commissioner was not authorized to do that, but ultimately the court sided with the commissioner saying that he'd given sort of the history of the, the, the commissioner's position within Major League Baseball and the power of that office and the role of that office, that they were not going to interfere with the commissioner's authority and that the commissioner having uh, the ability to safeguard the best interests of, the, of baseball, that they would respect that right. And sort of that's the spirit of these of the commissioner authority that has survived from the beginning of commissioners in baseball, um, that being Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis uh, of Major League Baseball, all the way to today, uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell, um, who also has a political um, uh, tie as his father was a senator. So the commissioner, historically speaking, is given a wide berth of authority, and that's created by, by contract. Um, we look at uh, different documents, whether it's the, the league constitution or the league collective bargaining agreement that empowers the commissioner to engage in this wide range of, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of things they can do in order to um, safeguard the best interests of the game. However, his or hers authority is balanced uh, based on some constraints. So the commissioner's authority is balanced against whether or not their scope of authority actually comports with what they're trying to do. So what's the defined authority say within the league governing documents? Does the commissioner have this power pursuant to a uh, constitution, a collective bargaining agreement, a different policy, etc.? 
Um, is the commissioner engaging in good faith? Are they doing this with a good faith belief that this is actually what they're empowered to do, or are they doing it to punish someone in, a, in an uh, unfair way? Uh, is their action uh, procedurally fair? And we'll get into that uh, soon because that talks about due process. And then, of course, is the commissioner's actions violating state or federal law? Because if it's contravening uh, federal or state law, then, it, then that very well might be outlawed. So sort of the takeaway message here in terms of how governance works within professional sport and whether or not courts are going to interfere with uh, the business of um, professional sports leagues is that courts are, are not going to interfere. They're going to defer to the commissioner's authority to act within what's called the best interest of the game so long as those actions do not contravene the league's own governing rules or um, are not, um, are not uh, a, uh, something that violates public policy or laws. So, for example... Um, there was a, a very, several various famous private uh, sports clubs like Augusta National uh, or Augusta uh, Golf Club, and they had a prohibition on accepting uh, people of color for a long time, and they had a prohibition on accepting uh, females. And of course, um, these could potentially contravene public policy because we as a society um, say that society is benefited. Uh, by diversity within within um, the various aspects of life, and a prohibition on uh, people from being a part of that club just by uh, their immutable characteristics, you know, their skin color or their national origin, et cetera, or their gender, uh, that that's not something that we support as, as a society. And so a court very well might set that aside and force that uh, organization to, um, to allow uh, the, the people access that they're blocking. So um, so long as an organization is not breaking their own rules or society's rules and they're acting fairly, then the uh, courts will actually choose not to intervene. And there's really a reason for this based on uh, when you're talking about commissioners overseeing disputes. The first reason is that courts realize that the people who have the most specific knowledge here should be the ones that are making the rules and enforcing the rules, um, such as the professional sports leagues and the commissioners and those executives. Um, it would take it would be an unwise use of of judicial resources to have a judge take the time to become to get up to speed on issues and controversies and the fundamentals of a sports league to rule on a dispute. That's just not a good use of. Of resources, rather, the courts are going to defer to the to the commissioner, uh, so long as they're not acting against public policy. And like I said earlier, the power of the commissioner really comes uh, from these different contracts. So, what is a contract? Well, we talked about it. Remember, it is a promise or set of promises between two or more people where rights and obligations are flowing in both directions, and both parties to the contract get something and both parties give something up. So here, commissioner authority is given through league constitutions, which is contracts usually between the uh, individual franchises and owners, as well as the league, and then collective bargaining agreements, which is documents that are, um, that are a big contract between the Players Association and then the, uh, the league itself. So for example, um, we have, why aren't you working? All right, thank you. So we have an example of a, a, um, constitution here, right here, the NBA's constitution and bylaws of the National Basketball Association. So this is from 2012, it's a few years old. But you can, here's the document that lays out the rights and responsibilities of the members of the NBA. And this is really a contract um, between the parties. So you can see um, that it's 
laying out sort of the foundational aspects of being a member in the league and what rules apply and what rules do not apply. And don't worry, this uh, information is up on Blackboard, so you can download it yourself and, and take a look. Um, so then also we have an example of a collective bargaining agreement. The collective bargaining agreement is between, once again, the league and the players association. So that's the league. This is the players association. It will lay out sort of how their relationship is going to play out over the life of this contract. I believe this contract goes until 2020. So, um, and you can also uh, read this in its entirety if you want some bedtime reading, or we're going to refer to a specific, uh, a specific clause in there later. So we've got collective bargaining agreements, we've got league constitutions, we've got the standard player contract that the, all players must sign, and then supplementary league, uh, supplementary documents, which we'll talk about later. So traditionally, any sort of commissioner discipline, although the commissioner is empowered by these different documents to engage in a, a wide variety of behaviors that are s intended to safeguard the best interests of the league, um, they are constrained by uh, public policy and due process. So anytime a league wants to uh, make a decision, whether it's uh, disciplining a player like they did with Tom Brady or Adrian Peterson, or maybe uh, allow for the relocation of a franchise to a, 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 new, um, a, a new city. Um, the league must think about during this decision-making process, well, how will this decision impact due process, or how will public policy be impacted? And really, due process is the right of the per of someone who is at risk of losing either a life, liberty, or property interest to have that interest um, safeguarded. And how we see that being safeguarded is where there is um, a, either a financial aspect or a, a liberty aspect um, from that is potentially going to be taken away from that person. So for the purposes of due process within sport, um, the traditional standard with private entities, again, this is a private association, professional sport leagues do not have any public aspects of them uh, in them. Uh, they're just private, usually uh, not-for-profit entities, although they do engage in substantial profit, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but the laws of private society govern these decisions. So a life issue really is usually when your uh, life is in doubt, if you're going to uh, be subject to the uh, penal system. Uh, that, but that's rarely implicated in sport. But liberty is about sort of any sort of uh, privilege that is important to one's ability to pursue their happiness or their reputation or their honor or integrity. It's things you really can't touch. Um, it's things you can't see. Uh, and then property is any sort of claim of entitlement, like a financial aspect, or you're not able to engage in a meaningful opportunity to participate in that activity. So um, Tom Brady being banned uh, for four games because of his alleged role in Deflategate, uh, that impacted his due process right uh, to property. So there's two types of due process issues when you're considering a professional sports league engaging in governance decision making. Substantive due process is supposed to protect a person on the receiving end of this decision from any sort of what's called arbitrary and capricious actions. It just basically means something is inconsistent, that the commissioner is going to suspend someone under a set of circumstances, like let's say that the, um, the, the player was uh, caught, um, he was caught cheating, uh, let's say gambling, on the game he was playing in. But then a similar circumstance, set of circumstances, or exact same set of circumstances occurs subsequently, but that commissioner chooses to, uh, to apply a different set of discipline to the person 
who engaged in the same act, uh, activity but did not receive the same penalty. So it's inconsistent. Then uh, several questions should be act, asked. Uh, does the regulation or rule have a proper purpose? So what is the rationale for this? Why are you doing this? Well, we're, we're disciplining Tom Brady because he knowingly, uh, what, he know, knowingly allowed this to happen, and then he, dest he destroyed evidence that would have been helpful in our investigation, and he wasn't cooperative. Okay, well then how does the regulation or rule clearly relate to the uh, accomplishment of that purpose? So you're going to uh, suspend Tom Brady for four games and say that uh, because you're, you're doing it for four games, uh, which goes above and beyond the penalties that the NFL prescribed uh, for a, an equipment violation, which is just a, a, a fine, and in, instead the NFL chose to analogize the manipulation of, of the footballs with in using performance enhancing drugs because both types of behavior are intended to achieve an unfair advantage. Well, I don't know if that makes that much sense. So then that question would become, from a due process standpoint, does the discipline fit the actual um, stated purpose of that discipline? So while substantive due process looks at the actual discipline and its reasonableness, pursuant to its stated goal, the procedural due process looks at, well, what sort of procedural protections, what methods were used as a way to, to effectuate this discipline. So the really procedural due process questions what was used as a method to, in, uh, to uh, decide what discipline was appropriate, allow the party on the receiving end to respond to the charges of that discipline, and then how was that discipline enforced? So really, at the end of the day, it's about receiving, uh, the question is, how much fair treatment did the person on the receiving end of this discipline receive? So... Uh, oftentimes, the more safeguards that are in place that are similar to what occurs in a court of law, the more likely a court is going to look upon the process by which the discipline was uh, imposed to be uh, compliant with procedural due process. So this is where you would probably see um, a league... Um, notifying the offending party of it, some sort of charge of what they're being, uh, what, what they are being um, uh, charged with. And then there probably is some sort of venue, some form where um, evidence can be taken and testimony can be taken and both sides can argue their uh, positions in front of a neutral fact finder who, use, who t is usually playing the role of a judge. Uh, attorneys are present for both sides, and then usually there's some sort of uh, ability to appeal. So this is really what we saw, and what we see mostly in um, in collective bargaining agreements when we when we're dealing with commissioner discipline issues. So we'll come back to this uh, very shortly. So kind of, again, uh, as a, as a, a, a um, to repeat myself, um, generally speaking, the powers of the commissioner within professional sport are pretty broad. The commissioner, th the commissioner has the authority to engage in a variety of actions that are intended to safeguard the best interests of the league. And if we actually look at this, um, we can see... Um, in the NFL, NFLPA collective bargaining agreement under commissioner discipline, uh, the commissioner has a wide berth to discipline people for whether it's players or whether it is staff or owners for conduct here that is deemed to be detrimental to the integrity of or public confidence in 
the game of professional football. So that's a very, very broad language. But that commissioner's authority needs to be balanced against public policy. And so questions would be asked whether or not the commissioner or the league's action violates state or federal law, is arbitrary or capricious, it's violating their own laws, it's against public policy, or it's, it is um, violating procedural or substantive due process, meaning that um, the action doesn't, isn't well tailored, well suited to um, achieve the goal or purpose that the league said it was supposed to uh, achieve. And then what sort of notice and ability to defend some yourself in a court-type setting did that person on the receiving end of that discipline receive? So we've got an example. We've actually got two examples of how this played out in recent years. So we have uh, the first one that took place involving now-disgraced former owner Donald Sterling, who at the time owned the NBA NBA's franchise, LA Clippers. So if we go back to April 25th, I believe of, of um, I believe, of, I don't know if it's 2013 or 2014, I think it was 20, it had to be 2013. Um, you had TMZ, the uh, gossip website, released an audio recording that took place between Donald Sterling and his purported mistress where in, during the surreptitious recording, because Sterling didn't know he was being recorded at the time, he made all types of uh, inflammatory and racially insensitive, state, insensitive statements about uh, people of color and minoritized populations. Once that recording had been released, it created a real firestorm within the NBA and really all throughout uh, popular culture. And as a way to try to uh, get on top of this and, and calm, uh, the, the, to put out this fire, Sterling does an interview with CNN's Anderson Cooper. Uh, however, uh, like I said, hilarity ensues because Sterling's responses and sort of flippant or critical remarks of, of different people, whether it was Magic Johnson or the NBA or the commissioner, actually exasperated the situation and made things worse. And so um, knowing that he had to do something rather quickly, uh, the NBA immediately started to conduct its, its own investigation of what was going on with Sterling uh, several, only several days after, this, um, after these uh, remarks were released to the public. And on April 29th, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, who had been on the job not that long, uh, as acting commissioner, banned Sterling from ownership of the Clippers in, in a sense, executed these different mechanisms that were in the NBA Constitution that forced Sterling to sell his stake in the team. And in addition, he would be disassociated with the NBA for life. And on top of that, he was fined the maximum uh, under governing contract, contracts, which was $2.5 million dollars. So how did this really play out? Why did um, why did Adam Sterling have the ability to discipline um, Don Sterling here? Well, I'm glad you asked, and I'll tell you. So in their um, once the press conference was taking place, and Sterling or and uh, Silver had announced these this discipline, um, the NBA published a summary of what it was doing. And so it provided uh, different facts uh, related to the Sterling saga, but then it provided the section where it said the basis for terminating Sterling's interest. And so you see it was under article, uh, Const the NBA Constitution, Article 13D, and it says that NBA membership may be terminated if a member or owner fails or refuses to fill, fulfill his contractual obligations to the NBA. So the NBA argued that the Clippers violated this provision because the salacious acts 
of, of making these statements and having these statements released was had the effect of taking a, a position or action that actually has a materially adverse impact on the league or its team in violation of the Constitution. So if an owner did something that was very disastrous, that was damaging to the league, then the league could terminate Sterling's interest. And probably what that was alluding to was you had uh, NBA sponsors who had already disassociated themselves with the with the Clippers. They'd stopped, they had severed their sponsorship agreement with the Clippers and were considering doing the same with the NBA. These were major sponsors. And then NBA players were protesting uh, these comments because they were, again, very racially inflammatory and sensitive and were contemplating uh, uh, a walkout or, or a strike uh, until Sterling was kicked out of the NBA. So these had a very serious effect on the well-being of the NBA. Uh, there's also additional clauses or additional reasons that you can read for yourself and additional clauses that dictate the violation, allegedly. So eventually this culminated in a, uh, in a hearing involving Sterling uh, and in the NBA. And the NBA, after allowing the hearing to occur and taking evidence, ruled that you know, Ster Sterling was to be stripped of his ownership interest, and it would, the franchise would be put up for auction. So this um, this saga raises some serious questions from a legal perspective about commissioner discipline. So although the NBA had seemingly the right to sever Sterling's ownership interest by virtue of the NBA Constitution, the question becomes, did those actions by the NBA and the commissioner um, contravene public policy or were illegal or something that violated a right that Sterling has? And so that really brings up the issues of due process. Does the act of losing your franchise qualify as a substantive due process issue? And if they were punishing Sterling for making these racist and wholly inflammatory comments, was the proper discipline in light of those comments to strip him of a team that ultimately I think sold for um, $2.5 billion, or at least $2 billion. So d did this cost him that big of an asset? Secondly, was there any procedural safeguards in place to afford Sterling procedural due process, such as access to counsel, um, the ability to present testimony and evidence, etc.? And we can talk about that later, but for, for now, I want you guys to look into that and think about that. So those are a couple of commissioner authority issues that come up with the Sterling saga. And then... Um, the final, um, the, the, the final issue here is involving the power of the commissioner um, is the recent cases involving Ray Rice, Tom Brady, and Adrian Peterson. And these cases w came to light for different reasons. Ray Rice was, uh, was disciplined not once but twice because of uh, him um, and his his fiance at the time, now wife, got a video captured them getting into a physical altercation in an elevator that culminated with Rice um, knocking out his wife in the elevator. It was very, very graphic, very you know disturbing video. Um, at the time when this initially came to light, only one there was only one camera that re that that were footage, footage was released. And it just showed Rice uh, dragging his fiance out of the elevator. And as a result of that footage being released, released um, the NFL initiated an investigation. They, and Rice met with them. And then as a result of that meeting, 
the commissioner disciplined Rice, I think, only for two games or maybe one game. And he got a lot of pushback for that. And then a second video was released, and it showed the interior of that elevator and what happened, and it was much more graphic. And the NFL chose to suspend Rice indefinitely because they said that what Rice had told them during the meeting did not comport with what was released in the film. And so what the NFL did was they uh, released Rice, or they disciplined Rice, pursuant to the personal conduct policy, which is sort of the brainchild of Commissioner Goodell. And the personal conduct policy, although it's not part of the collective bargaining agreement, was implemented shortly after Goodell uh, was uh, arose to power, and it allows the commissioner to engage in a wide variety of actions in response to uh, various expectation or various actions that players or coaches or staff, etc., uh, engage in. So. This personal conduct policy not only lays out the expectations and standards of conduct that anyone affiliated with the NFL must abide by, but it also provides a sort of um, a, 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 um, a policy for the investigative process and what happens after an issue does arise. So it's, it's had different iterations and it has uh, been, uh, as each policy has uh, been created, each subsequent policy has begotten, become more comprehensive. Ultimately, Rice challenged this discipline uh, via the collective bargaining agreement because although the collective bargaining agreement empowers the commissioner with a vast array of authority, Rice said that you disciplined me twice for the same uh, alleged conduct, and that's double jeopardy, and that's against public policy. And so it need, you need to stick to the first, um, the first discipline. Ultimately, the arbitrator that was uh, selected pursuant to the CBA agreed with Rice, and Rice won. But the NFLPA has not been as successful in subsequent tries involving Adrian Peterson and Tom Brady. So with Adrian Peterson and Tom Brady, uh, although they initially both were successful in their challenges, and it was based off of several different rationales, one with uh, Peterson was challenging the interpretation of the case that his, arbit his arbitrator um, had uh, come to the conclusion of, and with Brady, it was that he wasn't given due process and a litany of other issues. Um, ultimately, separate courts in both these cases sided with the commissioner, saying that the commissioner has broad authority for discipline uh, pursuant to the collective bargaining agreement and that courts are to respect that authority. So the commissioner, in terms of the commissioner's authority within the, within the NFL, is very strong at this point, and so long as the commissioner seemingly doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't violate uh, laws on the books or the NFL's own policies, the courts are going to uh, respect the authority of the commissioner and, and defer to his rulings. And this kind of goes back to um, the, the importance of these cases, goes back to what we're talking about in Chapter 3 involving uh, case precedent and stare decisis. Because once a, a court comes to its conclusion and renders a decision, that decision becomes precedent for subsequent cases. So we really um, are finding ourselves in a very interesting time in terms of commissioner, uh, commissioner authority. Um, like I said, the Rice case was overturned because of double discipline. But Brady and Peterson, both courts afforded a tremendous amount of deference to the commissioner and the arbitrator. And both courts linked their decision really to defer to the commissioner's authority pursuant to what's in the collective bargaining agreement. So 
because the collective bargaining agreement gave the commissioner such vast authority, the courts were going to respect that unless the commissioner did something that violated public policy, was arbitrary or capricious, etc. So some competitive advantages um, when you're talking about sport management practitioners uh, in, in creating uh, policies for, for professional sports leagues. So there, one must consider a variety of legal challenges that might occur when you're actually, uh, when you are So that's about it. So I'm going to wrap up, and uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. But uh, this is more of an entertaining aspect of when the law and sport interact, and I hope that uh, it was helpful. Thanks.